Hello and welcome to Foreign Policy Focus. This is episode 131 and I am the show's host Kyle. On this episode of Foreign Policy Focus, I'm going to be talking about the man who people label as the most dangerous in the world, the person who had not only Brexit, but the 2016 U.S. presidential elections making Donald Trump the president of the United States. He's invaded his neighbors, he's invading the Middle East and causing trouble everywhere in the world. And of course, this is your opinion of Vladimir Putin if you listen to people like Mitt Romney and Ray Rachel Maddow, who continue to push the establishment line that Russia is the root of all evil in the world. So if this is something you think that your friends need to hear, then think about sharing the show, foreignpolicyfocus.libsyn.com, thelibertarianinstitute.org, it's right there on the homepage, or you could go to Facebook and check out the Libertarian Union. All right, so let's get right into this. The f- The thing that really prompted me to want to do this show is a tweet by a uh, former GOP presidential candidate in the 2012 nominee. Of course, you know, we could have had Ron Paul, but instead we got Mitt Romney. And Mitt Romney tweets out, Putin today blames U.S. politics for icy relations. Get real. It was Russia invading sovereign nations, propping up dictators, hacking elections, abusing human rights, and cheating at the Olympics. Now, this isn't satire. This is real. I I swear, this is Mitt Romney's verified account. It's not, you know, Mitten's Romney 39, who's making this up in order to mock Mitt Romney, who was famously much more hawkish than Obama during the 2012 campaign. And really, uh, if you remember the soundbite where Donald Trump, I believe, then said to then Russian President Medvedev, that he would have more room to negotiate on some of these uh, United States missiles going up in East Europe after the election. And this was something that Mitt Romney really played on and wanted to use against Obama to become president. And this led to him, you know, fear, uh, starting up all this hate mongering and, and fear against Obama and the Russians and all that, which continues to this very day. Now, this was one thing noticeably that the Trump campaign lacked. It, it wasn't this hatred of Vladimir Putin that Hillary Clinton also ran on. It wasn't claiming that Vladimir Putin is the most evil man in the world looking to recreate that USSR and sneakily find a way to undermine and I guess obliterate the United States in a nuclear war or something insane like that. And so Donald Trump ran against that. He was like, nah, I could get along with Putin. Putin seems like an all right guy. Now, I'm guessing that Donald Trump was probably doing this to, in part, sound more right wing, but also just to infuriate the, the left, who, as Hillary Clinton was uh, during the presidential campaign, went absolutely insane on the Russia issue. Rather than having some kind of moderated, uh, realistic view of what's gone on between the U.S. and Russia, the establishment left adopted this absolutely satirical McCarthyite perspective where Vladimir Putin organized the stable of a latter a, 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 a hackers that not only had the DNC and Podesta emails, but also was able to have the U.S. election and undermine it with a hundred thousand dollars of Facebook ads. Of course, most of those Facebook ads right after the election, and this is you know who they pretend is the ultimate evil in the world. Now, not to be outdone in their stupidity, the establishment right has to go after it. So, if we look at this Romney tweet real quick, we just go after and see how terrible it is. First off, you know, saying Putin blames the U.S. for icy relations. It's not like this is the first uh, time that some one side or the other here has blamed the other for their problems. The United States has long blamed uh, Russia and said that Russia must pull out of the uh, Crimea Peninsula before the United States will even negotiate with Russia on anything. And it's basically blamed Russia this whole time. So it's not like Mitt Romney is like taking a breaking story here or being the first American to claim that, oh no, it's the Russians that started this. America always claims the other side starts it, but especially in this one, they've been, they've been going off it the whole time. The part about Romney's tweet that might be uh, one of the most comical is Wayne tweets, get real, like he, this is somehow a, a radical position he's taken or he's really taking a stand and defending the truth here. So let's look, uh, let's look, you know, former Governor Romney, what getting real would mean. Uh, it was Russia invading sovereign nations. Uh, that's one of the problems. Now, if you look at what's gone on, uh, when Russia's really moved outside its own borders in the Middle East and other places, they do have an alliance with Bulgaria and they do, uh, military operations with Bulgaria. But if you look at the rest of Eastern Europe, the United States is allied with Poland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. All that border Russia, uh, as well as I, maybe a, a couple other countries more south. The United States, of course, has relations with the government in East Ukraine. I'll talk more about Ukraine later, but we have troops in all those, uh, Eastern European countries. The other places that they would look to say that, uh, Putin invaded would be Georgia, where the United States, I believe, was training some 
jihadist linked people there who ended up coming down into Syria, most notably Omar the Chechen, who was the field commander for ISIS when they're on their big blitzkrieg taking a bunch of cities, was trained by the United States and obviously was a, a radical jihadist and he was kind of fighting in that area and was trained for that reason. So if you look at the, you know, Russian intervention there, it's certainly problematic. I don't agree with any interventionism, but the United States was also propping up jihadists on the other side. The other place would probably be Syria, where Russia was obviously invited, and then the Ukraine, where in 2012, while, you know, Mitt Romney criticizes Putin later in the, the tweet for cheating at the Olympics, while Putin was in Sochi cheating at the Olympics, uh, you, United States, you know, political pundits and even Victoria Newland were laughing as they plotted a coup in Ukraine to try to get Ukraine into the NATO orbit and to accept a loan from uh, Western countries rather than from Russia and possibly even join NATO are all the things that they were trying to do uh, while Putin was over on the other half of his country enjoying the Olympics. And so you could even look up, uh, it's as plain as day, if you go to YouTube and search F the EU, you'll see a video there of Victoria Newland talking to, I believe, a U.S. ambassador saying that Yats is the guy and, you know, this is the guy we want to take over Ukraine and straight up plotting the coup that is recorded and posted on YouTube. Uh, of course, the biggest scandal, according to, like, the Hannity's and Romney's and Maddow's of the world would be that Victoria Newland said F the EU, but I don't think she said F. I think she actually said the word there. Yeah, and to them, you know, it was real insulting to have a high-ranking Obama official say this uh, about the EU. But at the same time, she was playing a coup in Ukraine, which I probably shares the largest border with Russia and Eastern Europe and is seen as one of their key allies. In fact, I believe on the Colbert Report, somebody for, from the CFR later bragged that they were kind of stealing away Russia's girlfriend while Putin was over in Sochi and joined the Olympics. And then if you look at what America's done in contrast in invading sovereign nations, uh, you only have to Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, where they are uninvited compared to Russia as invited by the Syrian government. Uh, to some extent, you could argue, you know, the U.S. is invading Somalia and Libya. And so for the former presidential candidate of the United States who advocate for the U.S. to invade even more countries to look at this and possibly say that Russia is causing the relations to be icy by their foreign involvement. Ours is much, much worse. The next thing is propping up dictators. Obviously, the United States is doing that in several places, most obviously in Bahrain and then in Egypt too, where in Bahrain, the United States worked against the popular uprising during the Arab Spring to keep the Bahrain uh, leadership in power, as well as in Egypt, where when we didn't like the results of the Arab Spring, we helped to overthrow the elected leader and then put in a, a military leader, al-Sisi. Uh, it would be hard to argue that the United States doesn't support Erdogan, who's a dictator, although at the same time, uh, Russia supports them as well. Saudi Arabia, again, propping up a dictator, selling the regime there billions of dollars of weapons. Same with the UAE, where we're selling the royal family billions of dollars of weapons. Qatar... Uh, we've attempted to prop up the, the dictator Hadi in, in Yemen. So you look all over the world and find places. Uh, in the case of Russia, you could really only find one in that, that really being Bashar al-Assad. And then maybe they argue the Ayatollah or something like that. But there, there's not a whole lot of Russia involvement in Iran or even North Korea, which Russia shared a border with. And so again, if you're looking at a site to blame, you had to be completely one-sided. You had to be completely unable to see the world in anything but an American perspective to possibly believe that Russia is propping up more dangerous dictators around the world and causing more problems. The next thing, hacking elections. Of course, the United States has admitted to, you know, in, in getting involved in the CIA overthrowing tons of le- elections. I think some notable ones would be Honduras in 2009, Yemen in 2012, and then Iraq, I believe like in 2014-ish, that was where o- Obama had a lot of influence there with the leadership, but even before that, in all these countries. And, and then numerous, too, way too many to count our list off since, you know, the kind of the, during the Cold War, the creation of the CIA between now and then, but these are just some recent ones where Mitt Romney is pointing to, I believe, I'm guessing the claim that Russia had the U.S. election, where I've addressed tons of times on the show, and I don't have time to get into the whole thing. But the notion that Russia had the election in the sense that they went in and changed the votes counts, it has never even been uttered in any kind of serious manner. Assuming that this is Twitter, and he means it a little bit more generously, saying that Russia just got involved and undermined the U.S. election, 
we see that this isn't true either. They only spent about $44,000 uh, possibly spent. And it's not even the Russian government. It's just groups tied to the Russian government spent $44,000 on Facebook ads. A lot of those were just puppy ads and other things. And there's no way $44,000 of Facebook ads possibly influenced a multi-billion dollar U.S. election. And then there's also the brains that claim, but the Russians apparently only spent 97 cents worth of uh, Facebook ads in Russia uh, for the brands of vote. So again, can't really even begin to claim that that influenced the election. Veterans intelligence professionals for Sandy, Ray McGovern, William Binney, Binney, and several other brilliant people worked to prove that the DNC leads were just that leads and not hats that the files were downloaded onto a flash drive locally and then given to WikiLeaks and then eventually leaked uh, to the U.S. media. The last claim, of course, uh, or well, I guess the last two, abusing human rights is one of the last claims here that Romney made that Russia is doing so bad. Uh, yeah, uh, no doubt Russia abuses human rights. So does the United States. We have no place to complain and we really can't. As many civilians as Russia killed in the fight against ISIS, the United States killed probably as many or even more. The United States is working with Saudi Arabia to commit genocide in Yemen. No, really, this is actually happening. They're trying to starve the entire country to death. The United States backed al-Qaeda in both Syria and Libya, but particularly in Libya. They turned that state into a rape state and a slave state, so... Absolutely terrible things the United States has done, as well as, you know, Guantanamo torturing people, Obama not having the courage to prosecute those responsible, and the way that we treat our own civilians on a day-to-day basis. I mean, you know, roll back a couple episodes and listen to my show on the Daniel, uh, execution Daniel Shaver, where I go through how the police officers are willing, are able to just kill people in this country, and that certainly has to be considered a human rights violation. The last thing that Mitt Romney pointed to here was uh, that the Russia was uh, cheating at the Olympic Games. I don't see how this really matters uh, in international relations. I mean, maybe it makes Russia look kind of bad. But at the end of the day, I mean, if you're the president of the United States, you're not saying to Vladimir Putin, well, we would be willing to get rid of all of our weapons, but because you that. And so that's uh, my take on that Romney tweet. As you can see by my rant there, it really uh, just upset me. The fact that the, these people can be so dishonest. And in the, in the case when they're emphasizing additional honesty, he's like, get real. I'm going to tell you the real truth here. And it's just absolutely not the case. Like I said, you could point to Russia doing all these things, but the United States does them many, many times over to what to the extent that Russia does. And so for Mitt Romney to say that this is the reason that U.S. and Russia relations are bad is absolutely ridiculous. Hopefully this will lead to Mitt Romney's, you know, just generally being mocked because he's obviously a doofus and an idiot. Only a moron could look at the situation in the world for the past 15 years or so, uh, from the position of Mitt Romney, at least, who is somebody who's, you know, supposed to have studied all this stuff. He's the, you know, former governor of Massachusetts, potential future Senate candidate, and then 2012 Republican nomination, uh, nominee, how he could look at everything that's going on and say that, it's the Russia's fault that the relations are bad is just absolutely insane. Either that or he's just being straight up dishonest and is a liar. Some other things going on in the news with Mr. Putin is that he made a trip to the Middle East. He went to Turkey first where Erdogan gave a statement supportive of the Palestinians and denouncing Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Putin stood on stage next to Erdogan as he made this statement. So that I think that's a pretty significant move for uh, Putin. He then went to Syria and announced the withdrawal of a large portion of the Russian troops in Syria and declared ISIS defeated. Obviously, the declaring ISIS defeated is a premature. I don't think you could actually really defeat the Islamic State unless people just stop calling themselves Islamic Islamic State. But the Sunni, Sunni insurgency across the Arab world will continue to go on as long as these imperial powers continue to bomb these places. And then Putin went to Egypt and announced that uh, the Russians are lending the Egyptian government money to build a nuclear power plant. And so all these moves, I think, are very important just to look at and see how Putin is actually portraying himself to the people of the Middle East. I think this looks to be to be a move where Putin, Putin is really looking to get gain a lot of salt power in the Middle East. Of course, the United States and their Arab allied leaders, uh, the United States recognized the Jerusalem as the Israeli capital and the allied leaders to the United States have been more quiet than the unallied leaders to the United States. 
minus Erdogan, who kind of adds on his own in his own order anyways, but the, you know, Saudis and the Emiratis aren't out there denouncing the move like Erdogan is. And of course, Putin stands behind Erdogan while he says this. I think, you know, having this about meaning of, you know, Russia standing behind that statement. If you're somebody in the Middle East, uh, most everybody supports that statement that Jerusalem can't be made the capital of Israel. It's, it would destroy the possible two-state solution. It's going to see that as a good thing. The troop reduction in Syria. If you look at what the United States is doing in Syria, where they're uninvited and they're saying, even though ISIS is defeated, we're not going to leave. And Russia is saying, well, ISIS is defeated, so now we're leaving. Uh, that, that does seem to me that if you're somebody in the Middle East and you look at, well, if we have a problem... The Americans are going to come over here and they're going to put their troops where we don't want them and they're never going to leave and they're going to make the mess worse. But Russia, I think, is trying to set an example that, hey, we'll come and help, we'll defeat the bad guys and then we'll go home. Even if that's not ultimately what they end up doing, which I, I doubt it is, and I think that, you know, Russia killed a lot of Syrian civilians and that's a real problem. However, I, I think this is good optics for Trump or for Putin. And then, too, we had the United States and Russian, I believe, U- U.S. F-22s and Russian probably SU-35s having uh, some interceptions there over Syria. Uh, the fact that this ridiculous stuff is still going on when ISIS is all but defeated makes absolutely no sense, I'm sure, to anyone. And Egypt with the building of the nuclear reactor, I mean, it seems to me that Putin is definitely trying to win, you know, to quote the neocons, the hearts and the minds of the people of the Middle East. And rather than doing it all with bombs, uh, using some soft power here and standing by popular ideas is definitely a better way to do it than the United States has done it. Not, you know, that I'm signing off on all of this and I, like, again, don't think Putin's a great guy. However, I, I do think these moves are interesting in contrast to the United States moves, which is, you know, keeping the troops in Syria there, even though they're unwanted and starving all the Yemeni to death. One thing that the United States is very willing to export to the rest of the world, and this again doesn't make sense when Mitt Romney is blaming Russia for all their foreign interventions, that the United States apparently in 2017 sold the world 58% of all the all the global weapons. And so I don't even think this counts as the weapons that the United States is just giving away, like they announced they're giving the Lebanese army more helicopters. But we're just flooding the world with weapons. And then if anybody else sells anybody a weapon, we flip out if we're not absolutely approved of it. For example, the United States now is claiming that uh, they have proof that the missiles fired from the Houthis at Saudi Arabia were Iranian missiles. I've stated from day one that IHS Jane, which is regarded as kind of the independent international authority on these kind of things, says the same thing that a lot of other experts are saying is that these are not Iranian missiles. They're missiles either produced from the USSR or North Korea during the Cold War when Yemen was divided into North and South Yemen. Eventually, uh, Salah took power over all the military and thus gained control of the weapons. When he aligned himself with the Houthis, those missiles then, I guess, became available to the Houthi and are probably under their control now. Those missiles, they're able to convert uh, through technology apparently built in Yemen. They said these are the Birkin II designs onto the Scud missiles. And these are what's being shot from Yemen by the Houthis to Saudi Arabia and at, at one point the Riyadh airport. However, the United States and Nikki Haley stood up in front of a bunch of wreckage and said all this wreckage is from Iran and they stamped it with their logos to prove it. I guess until I see some proof outside of the United States government saying it, I'm definitely not just going to take them at their word. The U.S. government has lied themselves into pretty much every war they've been in for a very long time, uh, maybe minus World War II. And so I think there's very good reason to be skeptical of the claims that Nikki Haley is making. Reason that Nikki Haley making these claims is so important is that because now the House is looking at putting sanctions on Iran for arming the Houthis. And we also have Trump saying that the, or not Trump saying, but uh, two months ago, Trump gave his speech on Iran and gave them since the, the Congress 60 days to change the nuclear deal. This hasn't happened. That 60 day deadline has expired. So I guess by what Trump said about then, he should now be decertifying the Iran nuclear deal. But I guess we'll see what happens as time goes on. And so I guess just the idea of what's going on in Yemen, how even if the Iranians are giving the Houthis weapons, how this could be any sort of real problem. Right now, the Yemenis are completely blockaded. They're being deprived of food aid. They're being deprived of fuel. They're being deprived of medications. 
There's a, a cholera epidemic going on. There's a famine going on. There's a civil war going on. This is basically hell on earth right now. People are dying of every which way everywhere. Hospitals are being destroyed. Roads, bridges are being destroyed. And this is all happening because of the United States and Saudi Arabia. And so if the Iranians did give the Houthis a missile, this in no way justifies what's happening in Yemen or any U.S. involvement in the Yemen war at all. Just beside, because one side isn't completely innocent doesn't mean the Saudi side isn't completely guilty of trying to carry out a genocide. On top of that, uh, just to add all of it, we had the, a big, a couple big reports, or I think one big report with a couple big conclusions. And that is, I guess, a weapons expert had officially tracked U.S. weapons going through a Syrian rebel group and ending up in the hands of ISIS. So for everybody who called me a kook in the past couple of years, I told you so on that one. And also one of his conclusions was that ISIS uh, had a lot of their own weapons making facilities and I guess altered a lot of weapons that they were able to get. And this was one of the reasons they were so successful in urban warfare. It'll be interesting to see if other insurgencies now become more successful because once this information and technology is out there, I would imagine it's going to be somewhat easy to replicate. There's some pretty significant news going on in North Korea. First, we had Rex Tillerson coming out and saying that the United States would engage in talks uh, with North Korea without a North Korean agreement to give up their nuclear weapons. This would be a huge step towards making actual diplomatic games with North Korea, but the White House came out and put the kibosh on that. Doctors Without Borders has announced that 6,700 Rohingyas were killed when Myanmar started an ethnic cleansing campaign in August. That campaign lasted for about a month. In Yemen, just some updates. The Houthis are looking, are moving closer to forming some kind of a deal with the forces loyal to the former president Salah. This would uh, hopefully end a lot of fighting in Yemen. Also, part of this is that we have the Houthis agreed to release a lot of journalists who were being held as they were believed to be loyalists of the former president Salah. Saudi Arabia bombed a prison in Yemen. The interesting thing is this prison was filled with prisoners of uh, loyalists to Salah, which would realistically, I guess, at the last time they declared allegiances, would be allegiant to Saudi Arabia because that's who uh, was supporting Salah at the end. But Saudi Arabia destroyed this prison. Again, Similar to ISIS in a way, the Houthis aren't great people, and so just because you're in a Houthi prison, death's family doesn't make you guilty of a crime worth bombing you for. And the last thing, and I'll link to this because I think you'll probably just have to go through and really get the full weight of the article, but The Intercept did an excellent job profiling the U.S. ambassador to the Yemen who was appointed under Barack Obama. And how he really prevent, prolonged the war in Yemen and then the starvation of the Yemeni people by preventing humanitarian cranes from being installed at the port of Hadeda, who, where I've outlined several times is where a lot of the important aid would be coming in. But Saudi Arabia originally bombed the campaign, or the cranes there and then blockaded and prevent those cranes from reaching the port again, uh, as the United States sent replacements. And part of the reason was, uh, because of, uh, U.S. ambassador to Yemen, Yemen prevented that from happening. All right, th- guys, that's where I'm going to wrap up today's show. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, let me know. Uh, coming up, I guess I'm going to be doing some year-end shows. We're about halfway through December now. And what you would like to see in like a year-end show, uh, a wrap-up of some kind of uh, thing, or or what can we do here that would be interesting to everybody. So let me know. Show foreignpolicyfocus.libsyn.com, libertarianinstitute.org, iTunes, rating and review there. Libertarian is Union on Twitter. Uh, great guys there. I uh, really enjoy being a part of that group. Uh, always insightful. Always great podcast. So check that out on Twitter at K-Y-A-A-A-L-E. And uh, the, the website is kylesfilesball.com. Thanks, everyone.